Hi, my name is Brandon and I'm an alcoholic and addict in recovery. Today I want to talk some about changes, the kind of changes that we might want to make in our recovery in order to make our recovery more successful. I'm going to be reading some from Living Sober, put out by Alcoholics Anonymous World Services. And let's start with just some simple changes that might be might help you become more successful in your recovery, especially in your early recovery. So from the book, they say, certain set times, familiar places, and regular activities associated with drinking have become woven closely into the fabric of our lives. Like fatigue, hunger, loneliness, anger, and over-relation, these old routines can prove to be traps dangerous to our sobriety. To illustrate, many of us used to begin the day with a morning drink, and now we head to the coffee for head to the co head for coffee in the kitchen. Some of us shifted the order of things we did to prepare for the day, such as eating before bathing and dressing, or vice versa. A change in brands of toothpaste gave us a fresh, different taste to start the day with. We tried a little exercise or for a few quiet moments of contemplation or meditation before plunging into the day. So what they concentrate on in this section of the book is looking at the little things that we, the little habits that we've picked up in our addiction and trying to make changes there. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk about my experience with this in terms of how I was able to use the things that I was prevented from doing in my addiction to actually help me recover. So the first drug that I ever quit, um, that I was addicted to, that I ever quit was nicotine. I was a pack and a half cigarette smoker for um, 15 years and I loved cigarettes. I loved cigarettes. Um, and I smoked from the second I got up to that was the last thing I did before going to bed at night. And uh, so when I quit, I tried to quit smoking for several years. I, I tried dozens and dozens of times and was unsuccessful. And one of the things that really helped it stick for me when I finally did quit is I looked at all the different things that I couldn't do as a smoker and started to do those once I quit. So for example, um, when I was a smoker, I couldn't go to the movies without feeling some sort of anxiety. Um, halfway through the movie, I, I would stop wanting to watch the movie and, and want to go smoke a cigarette. And sometimes I did, and I would miss what was going on in the movie and it, it would just make the whole experience unpleasant. You know, um, I couldn't hang out with my parents very, very comfortably because I wanted to go smoke, you know, on uh, every 30 or 45 minutes and I knew they didn't approve of it. And so in when I stopped smoking, I got to embrace that time with my parents um, in a way that I, I hadn't been able to as a smoker. And then even little things like I was still, I was still drinking at that point and I, I enjoyed wine. And so I would think about, you know, how nice it was that I could actually taste what I was drinking or eating or things like that. And so really taking some time to capitalize on what the removal of your addiction does for your recovery and, and look at those things that you can do that you couldn't do. So that's one, that's one way changing things up and then appreciating and introducing the things you used to couldn't do, um, is a one way to help with the transition into recovery. Another question that gets asked a lot is what about my old friends, my old drinking buddies, my old using buddies. And here's what the book has to say about that. For many of us, this is also meant foregoing, at least for a while, the company of our hard drinking or hard using buddies. If they are true friends, they naturally are glad to see us take care of our health and they respect our right to do whatever we want to do, just as we respect their right to drink or use if they choose. 
but we have learned to be wary of anyone who persists in urging us to drink or use again. Those who really love us, it seems, encourage our efforts to say well. So um, I have maintained friendships with many of my friends who continue, who I used to love to drink and get high with. And I continue to be friends with those people and none of them have tried to get me to go back to doing that because they recognize that I'm happier where I am now and that what I've done is better for me and my family and ultimately it's improved our relationship as well. Our friendships have improved. So I have not had the experience of a friend trying to get me to go back to using or drinking. And I feel very fortunate in that. If you do have that experience where you have a friend who's trying to get you to go back to using or drinking, I think it's very wise to consider not being around that person, at least for the time being, especially in early recovery, because those kinds of people, um, if you have feelings attached to them, emotions attached to that relationship, then in moments of weakness, it can be hard to say no. And so it, it, there's, there's no reason to test your will around people that if they're asking you to indulge again in your addiction, also they don't have your best interests in mind and at heart. And so it's best just not to engage with those people, um, at least for the time being. The third thing that they talk about in this chapter is the question of once I'm sober, for instance, if I'm sober from alcohol, do I remove all the booze from the house? And two schools have thought about this. Um, and I'll read what they say here and then tell you what happened in my recovery. Some of us insist that it was never the availability of the beverage that led us to drink any more than the immediate unavailability kept us from the drink we really wanted. We live in a drinking society, they say, and cannot avoid the presence of alcoholic beverages forever. Keep the supply on hand to serve when guests arrive, they suggest, and just learn to ignore it the rest of the time. For those people, that worked. A multitude of others among us point out that sometimes it was incredibly easy for us to take a drink on impulse, almost unconsciously, before we intended to. If no alcohol is handy, if we'd have to go out and buy it, we at least have a chance to recognize what we're about to do and can choose not to drink instead. Non-drinkers of this persuasion say they found it better to be safe than sorry. So they gave away their whole stock and kept none on the premises until their sobriety seemed to be in a fairly steady, stabilized state. Even now, they buy only enough for one evening's guests. So you're going to have to figure out what works best for you and what makes the most sense for you. For me, um, I was in the latter, the former category, um, where I knew that, you know, I, I was, my wife drinks and we have friends who drink and we were going to continue having those friends over and I was not going to ask them not to drink. So I knew I was going to be around it. And I kind of had the thinking that I should from day one continue to be around it. Um, and because, yeah, I, the availability of it was never an issue for me. If I was out of beer, uh, you know, I had a dozen places within walking distance that I could go to to get it. So, you know, if just getting rid of the booze in the house was not a huge impediment to my ability to drink, I, I had plenty of ways to drink pretty much 24 hours a day if I wanted to, if, if I felt like I really wanted to. So for me, it made more sense to leave booze in the house um, and, uh, and look at my own conviction to not drink as my guide and, and really focus in on the fact that, you know, it's not the availability that, that enables me to drink. It's my 
addiction that pushes me to drink. Um, but that's just me. Other people are different. And as with everything in recovery, there are many different paths. You have to find what makes the most sense for you. And um, if you are the type of person who, you know, feels like just having it available might endanger your sobriety in a moment of weakness, there's nothing wrong with getting rid of the booze in the house until you feel otherwise. And if you never feel otherwise, that's okay too. You know, um, I would encourage you to look at that with a sponsor. Um, if you're, if you're working a program to look at that and see if there's anything that you need to work on around that. But, um, bottom line is do what you feel is safest for your recovery, your sobriety, and the people that you're living with at the time. So that's it for the uh, changes that we might need to make in recovery. Um, and uh, of course, there's many, many more changes that we can make. We could go on and on about this. But this is just a nice little outline of the kinds of things to consider when you're looking at trying to make some of the changes that might help you in the early stages of recovery break free of the habits that kept you locked into your addiction. Have a great day. I'll see you back here tomorrow.